When I was seven years old, my aunt decided that I was old enough to help her in the kitchen. My first tasks as her assistant included grating cheese, chopping onions, and peeling what felt like an infinite number of potatoes. But there was one culinary lesson my aunt stressed over all the others. Before she let me preside over an actual pot of anything, I had to learn, or rather my mouth had to learn, how to check for salt. Under my aunt's tutelage, I learned that it was possible to get every ingredient in a dish just right and still ruin the dish with salt. Too little salt, and it would remain bland and lifeless, all of its potential zest and kick subdued. Too much salt, and it would lose its depth and complexity to a sharp, unbearable bitterness. In our gospel reading for this week, Jesus says, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything, but it is thrown out and trampled underfoot. Living as most of us do in a culture of plenty, we take household goods like salt for granted. But as Mark Kurlansky writes in his book, Salt, A World History, from the beginning of civilization until about 100 years ago, salt was one of the most sought-after commodities in human history. The ancients believed that salt would ward off evil spirits. Religious covenants were often sealed with salt. Salt was used for medicinal purposes to disinfect wounds, check bleeding, stimulate thirst, and treat skin diseases. Roman soldiers were sometimes paid in salt, hence our English word, salad. Brides and grooms rubbed salt all over their bodies to enhance fertility. The Romans salted their vegetables as we do our modern-day salads. Around 10,000 years ago, dogs were first domesticated using salt. People would leave salt outside their homes to entice the animals. And of course, in all the centuries before refrigeration, salt was essential for food preservation. Nowadays, we still use salt for all sorts of things. Salt accentuates flavors, melts ice, softens water, and hastens a boil. It soothes sore throats, rinses sinuses, eases swelling, and cleanses wounds. In some contexts, salt has more than a flavor. It has an edge. It stings, burns, abrades, and irritates. If we don't have enough salt in our body, we die. But if we have too much, we also die. I know that it's possible to take a meta metaphor too far. No single descriptor from the scripture, salt, light, bride, clay, sheep, branch, dove, soil, will capture or contain the entirety of what it means to live as followers of Christ. But when Jesus calls his listeners the salt of the earth, he is saying something profound, something we'll miss in our 21st century context unless we press in and pay attention. First of all, he is telling us who we are. We are salt. We're not supposed to be salt or encouraged to become salt or promised that if we become salt, God will love us more. The language Jesus, Jesus uses is 100% descriptive. It's a statement of our identity. We are the salt of the earth. We are that which will enhance or embitter, soothe, or irritate, melt or sting, preserve or ruin. For better or for worse, we are salt of the earth. And what we do with our saltiness matters. It matters a lot. Whether we want it to or not, whether we notice it or not, whether we're intentional about it or not, we spiritually impact the world we live in. Secondly, we are precious. Again, it's easy to miss the importance of this in our modern world, where salt is cheap and plentiful. But imagine what Jesus' first followers would have heard when he called them salt. Remember who they were. Remember what sorts of people Jesus addressed in his famous Sermon on the Mount. The poor, the mournful, 
the meek, the persecuted, the hungry, the sick, the crippled, the frightened, the outcast, the misfit, the disreputable, the demon-possessed. You, he told them all, you are the salt of the earth. You who are not cleaned up and shiny and well-fed and fashionable, you who've been rejected, wounded, unloved, and forgotten, you are essential. You are worthwhile. You are treasured. And I am commissioning you. For all of us who spent days, months, or years trying to earn divine favor, believing that our piety might someday make us precious in God's eyes, I hope this metaphor will stop us in our tracks. Jesus knowingly named a commodity that was priceless in his time and place. He conferred great value on those who did not consider themselves valuable. And he is still doing this for us now. Thirdly, salt does its best work when it is poured out, when it is scattered, when it dissolves into what it's around. I would have done my or I would have done my aunt's recipes no favor if I'd kept our salt shaker locked in the kitchen cabinet. Salt isn't meant to cluster. It's meant to give of itself. It's meant to share its unique flavor in order to bring out the best in all that surrounds it. Which means that if we want to enliven, enhance, deepen, and preserve the world we live in, we must not hide within the walls of our church. We must not cluster and congregate simply for our own comfort. We must not retreat into our pious theological bubbles out of fear, cynicism, shame, or self-righteousness. Salt doesn't exist to preserve itself. It exists to preserve what is not itself. Another metaphor for this, a metaphor Jesus used all the time, dying. Jesus calls us to die to self to die in order to live. Remember, we are salt. It's not a question of striving to become what we are not. It's a question of living into the precious fulfill fullness of what we already are. Luckily, or not luckily, sorry, lastly, salt is meant to enhance, not dominate. Christian saltiness heals. It doesn't wound. It purifies. It doesn't desiccate. It softens. It doesn't destroy. Even when Christian saltiness has an edge, even when, for example, it incites thirst, it only draws the thirsty towards the living water of God. It doesn't leave the already thirsty parched, dehydrated, and embittered. One of the great tragedies of historic Christianity has been its failure to understand this distinction. Salt fails when it dominates. Instead of eliciting, good, eliciting goodness, it destroys the rich potential all around it. Salt poured out without discretion leaves a burnt, bitter sensation in its wake. It ruins what it tries to enhance. It repels. This, unfortunately, is the reputation Christianity has all too often these days. We are known as the salt that exacerbates wounds, irritates souls, and ruins goodness. We are considered arrogant, domineering, obnoxious, and uninterested in enhancing anything but ourselves. We are known for hoarding our power, not for giving it away. We are known for shaming, not blessing. We are known for using our words to burn and not heal. This is not what Jesus ever intended when he called us the salt of the earth. Our preciousness was never meant to make us proud and self-righteous. It was meant to humble and awe us. So what do we do? Our vocation in these times and places is to not lose our saltiness. That's the temptation, right? To retreat, to hide, to choose blandness instead of boldness to keep our love for Jesus as a hushed and embarrassed secret. But that kind of salt, Jesus told his listeners, is useless. It is untrue to its very essence. And so, we are called to live wisely, creatively, and in balance. To learn, as my aunt put it when I was a little girl, 
how to check for salt. Salt, at its best, sustains and enriches life. It pours itself out with discretion so that God's kingdom might be known on the earth, a kingdom of spice and zest, a kingdom of health and wholeness, a kingdom of varied depth, flavor, and complexity. In his Sermon on the Mount, Jesus makes concrete the work of love, compassion, healing, and justice. It's not enough to simply believe. It's not enough to bask in our blessedness while all around us God's creation burns. To be blessed, to be salt, to be followers of Jesus is to take seriously what our identity signifies. We are the salt of the earth. That is what we are, for better or for worse. May it be for better. May your pouring out be for the life of the world. Amen. Announcements. Do you want to make an announcement about the diocesan thing? If you are not um, <laughs> receiving the newsletter from the diocese, there's kind of a major announcement that was uh, sent out this week about discerning if the Diocese of Northern Indiana and the Diocese of Indianapolis should uh, try to merge into one diocese. Um, and so uh, that has a pretty significant, I think, uh, impact thinking about how, who we are, how we serve, and all of those things. Um, so if you didn't get the newsletter, I have copies of it in the parish shop, you can take a look at it, and it's very much the entering in conversations about what this would look like and those kind of things. Uh, it sounds like there's been some conversations that have had before, like leading up to this point, uh, but basically since Bishop Jennifer and their bishop have been in their roles, they've been kind of talking closely in a way, so. Awesome. Pub Theology is this week, Thursday at 7 at Pub 15. Next Sunday is uh, Life Sunday, so bring your donations for that. Any other announcements? Yeah, um, I'd like for everybody to pray for Brother Charlie. Oh, he fell, broke his humerus. Oh. And um, they were going to go to uh, an ortho Monday. But it's kind of broken in here. I saw Charlotte at Walmart. Gotcha. <laughs> I got the news. So, yeah, we got the home. Did you? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I was just going to comment, but right after Dave and I moved down here, the Diocese of Northern Indiana was a bishop that was part of the movement to leave the Episcopal Church. So I think it's very interesting to see that that is kind of a circle. Right? Oh, wow. You know, as myself, everyone. Um, I did have an announcement. At the end of the meeting, there was a sign up for volunteers to do different things around the church. So if you did not turn that in and you're interested in helping with things like, I mean, it's a huge lot of us opening the church, updating the hymn numbers. Um, I guess why I'm standing up today is we need to, I need to redo the list for people that are assigned to be readers um, that would be doing prayers with people and acolytes. So we also would like to try and get the nursery up and running again. And if we have enough people sign up to be interested in ushers, I'd like to have that on the list as well. So if you could try and get that in this month, because I'd like to, for March, like for March through July, do a rotation. Those of you that did sign up, um, I've just done February. So check it to cut off that you want for reading prayers. I don't think that, I think that's the only change that I've made, so that's what I'm just going to be doing that over the next year. It's just for February and I'm more like, And the coffee outside of she, if you would like to bring food, um, we don't have anybody signed up at the beginning next week. And so if you are interested in it, probably with that, mostly coffee hour on the sign up sheet, but also we have a sign up sheet for the next few weeks. So. Lots of opportunities. We also still technically do not have a senior warden. <laughs> it's not necessarily something that we can live without, um, especially since uh, I'm not a full-time priest. I'm a supply plus priest, um, which means that we need the senior warden to do some of the business parts of the church. So keep praying about that, please. Any other announcements? 
Oh, I'm single today um, because it is Scout Sunday. Um, so you'll see underneath when I'm de robed I have my Scout uniform on. I'm actually the chaplain for Troop 1190, which is a girls um, Boy Scout troop out of Nashville, Indiana, which is where Sarah is today at the Methodist Church, um, since they're the ones who sponsor the church. So, and the kids are with their dads. Um, that's just a mean, lonesome story. Um, <laughs> any birthdays or anniversaries? 